Hello students, in today's session we will be discussing an important topic under the cardiology section that is infective endocarditis. So the learning objectives of this session, at the end of the session the student must be able to understand and discuss the etiopathogenesis and types of infective endocarditis, the student should be able to discuss the clinical features of infective endocarditis, the student should be able to list the diagnostic criteria the Duke's criteria that we have. So, you should be able to discuss the diagnostic criteria. The student should be able to enumerate the complications of infective endocarditis and yes, the student should be able to discuss the management and prophylaxis for infective endocarditis. So, this is the learning objectives of this session. So, I will be going through this in today's session. Let us begin our discussion with a case. So, here we have a 36 year old gentleman who has presented with fever for the last 7 days with worsening breathlessness. The fever is high grade, it is continuous, associated with cough and breathlessness. There is no history of hemoptysis, decreased epicyte also was associated. So, this patient is having a fever which has been going on for 7 days, which is a high grade fever. So, it is a young male that you have. On examination, you have pallor, there is grade 2 clubbing that is present and palatal petechiae that is present. So, these are certain findings that could be there. And on cardiovascular system examination, you find that there is a cardiomegaly, there is a soft first heart sound and there is a blowing pan-systolic murmur in the mitral area. The respiratory system says shows that there are bilateral basal crepitations, the liver is mildly enlarged, 5 centimeters enlarged. So, here we have a patient with a fever which has been a continuous high grade fever which has been going on for uh, 7 days and more here. And on examination, the patient has a cardiac murmur. So, is it related? So, there is a patient who has a cardiac murmur, there is a fever that has been going on. Along with that, you have pallor, there is clubbing and palatal petechiae. So, these are signs of a peripheral immunological phenomena or a peripheral uh, embolic phenomena that you can find in infective endocarditis. Also, there is hepatomegaly and there is crepitations in the lungs. So, which could be suggestive of a heart failure that has been going on. So, together with this, we can make the diagnosis of bacterial endocarditis, the suspected bacterial endocarditis. We will have to confirm it based on our investigations. We will have to do a blood culture and echocardiography and demonstrate if there is vegetations or not. So, that is the first end, uh, diagnosis that we could have in this patient. It could be acute rheumatic fever also. The second differential diagnosis that we can have is acute rheumatic fever. So, we will have to watch and investigate in, in terms of acute rheumatic fever also. So, the second differential diagnosis could be acute rheumatic fever. We will have to uh, investigate in lines of rheumatic fever also. But if you see uh, grade 2 clubbing, the palatal petechiae is unlikely with acute rheumatic fever. We do not get this. These are more in, seen in case of infective endocarditis. So, these are the two things that we will have to think of and we will have to investigate and manage. So, in the investigation, the two important investigation is the blood culture sensitivity that we have to do and the echocardiography. So, these are the two investigations which will help us in arriving at a diagnosis of infective endocarditis. So, let us begin the session of infective endocarditis. So, infective endocarditis is nothing but the infection of the endocardium the valves, the inside of the heart. Also, if there are any prosthetics, if they are infected or a vascular indwelling structures, if they get infected, they all become cause of infective endocarditis. So, by definition, infective endocarditis is endovascular infection of the cardiovascular structures by microbes. So, it could be the heart valves most often. It could be the atrial or ventricular endocardium. It could be large intrathoracic vessels or it could be intracardiac foreign bodies, could be a pacemaker that is there, could be a surgical conduits, it could be prosthetic valves. So, if they get infected intracardiac subs, they are called as infective endocarditis. So, it is the endovascular infection which is caused by micro. So, what happens as a pathogenesis of infective endocarditis? So, remember the valve may be normal or the valve may be damaged. Damaged valves are more prone to get infected. So, whenever there is a bacteremia that happens due to any cause, there is a bacteremia that is happening there, the bacterial colonies in the blood is very much high. When they come in touch with this damaged cardiac valve endothelium, these bacteria start locating there, to translocating there and there we have something called as 
a vegetation that starts. So, the initiation of the vegetation. So, vegetation is nothing but a colony of organism surrounded by inflammatory cells. So, it could be platelets, it could be mononuclear cells that could happen there and this vegetation will start progressing and then you have the vegetation that gets progressed there totally. The bacteria are engulfed with the fibrin mesh there, the mononuclear cells which are surrounding that. Now, what happens to this vegetation is based on the size of the vegetation, the vegetation if it is, if there is no enough immunity or if there is no antibiotics given, this vegetation can progress and they can cause damage to the neighboring walls. So, the walls can get destroyed, it can get lysed and it forms the emboli and this infective emboli can go further and go to spread to various parts of the body and this bacteria from the emboli or the vegetation can act as an idus of sepsis and that can keep increasing, it can keep increasing the bacteremia in the body and this can spread locally, it can spread systemically. So, this is the pathogenesis of infective endocarditis that we have. So, you have bacteremia which acts on the either a normal valve, if you have a very virulent bacteria like staphylococcus, they can damage the valve or else the less virulent bacteria like streptococcus, they come and attack on the nidus on the damaged valve and there is where the vegetation starts, it initiates, it progresses and then embolizes and spreads to the local tissue that is there. Also you have to remember whenever there is a antigen antibody reaction that is happening in the body between the microbe and the self antibodies that are produced, there is activation of the immune system. And this immune complexes which are formed during the process of infective endocarditis can damage the body's own structure. So, they can damage the kidneys which can produce glomerulonephritis, it can go and damage the vessels, it can cause vasculitis, it can form uh, aseptic emboli that could be there, it can go and damage the joints. So, you get a lot of manifestations other than infections due to immune complex that is getting activated due to infective endocarditis. So, this is the pathogenesis of infective endocarditis. Coming to the classification of infective endocarditis, the basic classification is based on the clinical course. We call it as acute bacterial endocarditis when it is less than 4 weeks, subacute bacterial endocarditis when it goes to 4 to 8 weeks of the course and chronic is anything more than 2 months, we call it as a chronic endocarditis. Based on the organism, it could be bacterial endocarditis, it could be viral like coxsackie, rickettsial, coxiella can cause fungal like candida can produce endocarditis. Next is based on the type of the valve that is getting involved. So, it could be a left sided endocarditis, it could be a prosthetic valve endocarditis, it could be a right sided endocarditis which is commonly seen with the IV drug abusers, it could be a device related endocarditis based on the valve or you have one more classification called as whether it is a native valve endocarditis or a prosthetic valve endocarditis. So, these are the various classifications. Now, why do you have to know this classification? The importance being acute endocarditis is caused by more virulent organisms. Fungal endocarditis are difficult to treat. The device related endocarditis, we may have to remove the device, otherwise the infection may not settle. The prosthetic valves may be have to replaced. Also, right sided endocarditis, which involves the tricuspid valve, etc., are more likely to be in IV drug abuses. So, based on the type of the endocarditis, the organism may be different, the management also varies. So, that is why we have to know the classification of endocarditis. Coming on to the risk factors. So, what is the risk factors associated with endocarditis? Most important is the underlying heart disease. Now, the heart disease or the valves or the muscles of the uh, endocardium wherever there is damage happening. So, if you remember, if there is a more uh, flow which is getting hampered at that part or there is a turbulence that is there at a particular structure, that is where you can have more chance of damage that is going to happen to the valves. Always remember that regurgitant lesions are more likely to produce endocarditis or endocarditis can produce regurgitant lesion. If you see the stenotic lesions, mitral stenosis, aortic stenosis, the gradient is much higher in the aortic valve compared to the mitral valve. So, aortic valve stenosis is more likely to produce infective endocarditis, mitral stenosis is very less likely to produce. If you see the uh, congenital heart disease, the ventricular septal defect, the PDA and the ASD, these are asynotic, there is lot of shunt, there is flow there. 
VSD and PDA are very common to produce infective endocarditis whereas ASD endocarditis is very very rare. So please remember in ASD and mitral stenosis isolated infective endocarditis is very rare because the gradient that is there existing there between the valve or the surface which is the blood flowing through is very minimal. In contrast aortic stenosis, VSD, PDA are very common to produce a infective endocarditis. So the congenital cyanotic heart diseases like tetralogy of Fallot are per se predisposed for infective endocarditis because the amount of deoxygenated blood or the blood which bypasses the lung and reaches the heart is much higher there. So the organism load is much higher in those conditions. Also if you say the percentage of infective endocarditis, mitral valve is most commonly because that is the first sieve that could happen from the left side, mitral regurgitation I mean, aortic stenocytic regurgitation, rare to have tricuspid valve. Whenever we have a prosthetic valve that is there, it is an idus that can have infection. So if you have a prosthetic valve or if there is a intracardiac uh, pacemaker and the leads, they can get infected. Other important factor that you have to consider is the impaired host defense mechanism. So supposedly the patient is immunocompromised, diabetes, leukemias, lymphomas, cytotoxic chemotherapy, neutropenia, they are more likely to get infected. Also, there should be bacteremia. So from where does this bacteremia come? It is due to procedures. Usually it is secondary to procedure. Could be genitourinary procedure, could be gastrointestinal procedure, a surgery could be there or a simple dental procedure where the organism would enter the blood transiently and there is a transient bacteremia. <music>